Welcome back. We're watching a third night of uh, demonstrations in multiple cities across the United States. People protesting the election of Donald Trump. Many people expressing fear and sadness across the country. Obviously, more than half the country, though, also uh, very excited and, and excited about uh, what's uh, going to be uh, happening over the next several years. We'll be keeping an eye on the protests, continue covering them throughout the night. One of the many statements that Trump made that did not sit well with many people last December, Trump called for a total and complete shutdown, a temporary one, of Muslims entering the United States until we could, quote, figure out what is going on, end quote. Over the summer, uh, he uh, lashed out at the parents of a slain Muslim-American soldier. Both of these incidents sort of lost Trump the support of some Muslim-American voters, but certainly not all. Asra Nomani wrote an opinion piece in the Washington Post that says she's one of the silent, secret Trump supporters, though she's now neither silent nor secret. She wrote in part, quote, this is my confession and explanation. I, a 51-year-old a Muslim, an immigrant woman of color, and one of those silent voters for Donald Trump, and I'm not a bigot, racist, chauvinist, or white supremacist, as Trump voters are being called, nor part of some white lash. Azra Namani joins me tonight. So, Asra, explain why you voted for, for Donald Trump. What made you, as a, as a Muslim woman, choose him over Secretary Clinton? The condition of my life has not improved over the last eight years, and I'm a lifelong Democrat, I'm a lifelong liberal, I believe in progressive values, and so I wanted a new opportunity for change. What I hope will happen, most importantly for me as a Muslim, is that we will deal honestly without obfuscation on the issue of Islamic extremism. That's been my greatest disappointment over the last eight years. We've been doing this dance and I know that people have a lot of well-intentioned arguments for why they believe Muslims are better protected by not talking about the Islam in Islamic extremism. But I believe that we have to confront the issue honestly and, and directly. And I saw in Donald Trump's national security solutions a clarity on that point that is to me very important. I understand that in hearing that Secretary Clinton, that the Clinton Foundation had received money from, you know, Qatar or Saudi Arabia, that that also made a big impact on you? It did. You know, Anderson, I believe in the feminist movement that is the pantsuit revolution. I want to see a woman as the chief executive of the United States of America. But at the same time, I don't want to compromise on values that are really important to me. And the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia, to me, as a Muslim, represent the darkest interpretation of Islam that's out there in the world, and they represent a denial of progressive values. That's my moral consistency. And when I saw that first memo that showed the documentation of money from the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia to the Clinton Foundation, I was so distressed. What really killed it for me, though, was the email from Secretary Clinton to her aide, John Podesta, acknowledging that the governments of Qatar and Saudi Arabia are funding and financing and supporting the Islamic State and other radical mm -hmm. Muslim groups. That's the kind of honesty that I want to see in policy. And unfortunately, for whatever reasons, I haven't seen that delivered in the democratic platform on solving this issue of terrorism in our world today. When, obviously, you know, we talked to a number of Muslim Americans who expressed fear about uh, Donald Trump, about some of the rhetoric uh, that came up during the campaign, particularly the idea that initially that Donald Trump seemed to have of uh, banning Muslims from coming into the United, a temporary ban, he called it, uh, on Muslims coming to the United States until they figure out, you know, what the heck was going on. He seemed to have kind of morphed that into air, bans on people from areas where uh, there is Islamic terrorism. Um, did that concern you at all? Because the argument on that was if you, not only is that un-American to ban people based on religion, but that it actually alienates the very people who we should be trying to bring closer in order to fight radical Islam, Islamic terrorism. Well, you know, Anderson, I've watched you go from the streets of Orlando to Paris in the wake of this blood that has been spilled in the name of Islamic extremism. And it is, breaks my heart that we don't deal clearly and honestly with this problem that confronts us by thinking that we are protecting Muslims by not talking about it. Mm. That is the propaganda movement of the government that want us to avoid a conversation on ideology. 
Qatar and Saudi Arabia don't want us to talk about Islam because if we do, it indicts the Islam that they practice. Well, yeah, uh, Asr Namani, I, I really appreciate you being on the program tonight and, and talking about uh, the, the way you see it and what influenced your vote. And uh, I urge everybody to read your, your piece, and we'll uh, put a link up on our website to it. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anderson, and thank you for having an open heart and an open mind to all these ideas. Well, it's great to get uh, people from all different walks of life and different perspectives. So, Asr, thank you so much. Thank you. Got to take a quick break. Up next.